Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here with you today and hope I have a chance to see some of you in person in the, in the coming semesters. My name is Holly Gibbs and I'm a professor in the Department of Geography and also in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Um, and, and I lead a large lab group called GLUE for short, which is the Gibbs Land Use and Environment Lab. And we are a large team of interdisciplinary researchers and we work together along with collaborators from around the world to tackle complex policy relevant science questions focused on land systems. We want to understand how and why people use land around the world and, and what that means for the environment. For us, most important, we want to work towards finding solutions. So we always say we're conducting science for solutions. And that means that we spend a lot of time talking with policymakers, companies, and environmental groups to share our results as we're conducting the science, and also as we identify what questions to ask. I, I, I study I study commodity agriculture around the world, looking at corn and soy in the US, and also soy, beef, and leather across Latin America, as well as palm oil in Southeast Asia. I spent a, a wonderful year in New Zealand studying dairy, and I also hope to continue with that. Um, but a lot of my research is focused in Brazil, and there I have this, this large research team that's trying to tackle some of those questions. I focus on Brazil in part because Brazil, along with the US, are some of the largest food, producer, food producing and exporting countries in the world. And those are the types of things I wanna talk about for the rest of our time together. As you know, there is a growing demand for global food production. In fact, some people estimate that it might need to double by 2050. That's huge, double, right? We're at 2020. Um, so this would require huge changes in how we do things. And just to quickly review, why would we need to double food production? Because we see a rapidly growing population and also increasing per capita income. And these two things together mean that we will have a lot more consumption and especially the increases in income and urbanization mean that we'll have a lot more meat consumption. In fact, perhaps 73% more meat consumption. And we know that more meat means that we will need more land and be a greater burden on the environment um, when we think about meat production at large scales. So what's gonna happen next? How can we do this? How could we think about doubling food production? Well, there's two main ways that you can think in very broad scales about how we would increase global food production. The first is increase yields. And you can do this through intensification and efficiency gains, through chemical fertilizers, but also through much more sustainable pathways that I'm sure you're learning a lot about in this class. Um, but when you look at it at the big picture, we see that the yield increases are not likely to be fast enough. We're talking about one to 2% per year that's not gonna be enough to double food production over the next 30 years. So a lot of the increased food production is likely to occur through expanded harvested, harvested area or more croplands, right? And that's what I wanna talk about today. If we need more land, where will we get it? How will we expand those croplands to get to that increased harvested area? I think a good place to start is to look at where are our crops grown today. So here's a map showing global agriculture today. And we can see that about 40% of the ice-free land surface is used for cultivation or grazing right now. That's an area the size of South America for croplands and an area the size of Africa for grazing lands. If you can, pause and take a deep breath and think about that. That's a huge amount of area that we've already cultivated um, and co-opted for, for our uses. And when we look at this map, there's only three main types of spaces that are gray, that are not currently used. Icy areas that are too cold, desert areas that would be very difficult to cultivate, and then the tropics. And so when we think about where croplands will expand, I would argue, and many others would agree, that most expansion will occur in the tropics. We have cheap land, cheap labor, which comes together to mean high profits. Um, we also see that most of the tropics is biophysically suitable 
to be very productive for soy, oil palm, or sugar cane production. And so these are the most profitable and highly exported crops. So that adds even more motivation. In addition, we know that most of the remaining arable land or cultivatable land is located in the tropics. In this graphic, the yellow bars are showing the area that is suitable for cropland but has not yet been used. And we see that two thirds of the world's arable lands is located in the tropics. Many other regions such as Asia, Afri parts of Africa, South Asia, <laughs> South Asia, we can see that the pink area is much bigger. And that means that they have already cultivated nearly all of the suitable land. We also know that agricultural land will expand in the tropics simply because that's what it's doing now. When we look back over the last several decades, we see that most of the land expansion for agriculture happened in the tropics. That's the red color. The green is showing places that either declined in the total area of agriculture or at least the rate of expansion has declined. But the next question is where will this new land come from? If we know that croplands have been expanding, where have they been expanding into? And what do we expect for the future? Looking around at all these pictures from a pristine rainforest to a, a soy field up in the top left, you can see that the, the type of land converted for agriculture to feed the world has a huge impact. These are very different pathways. To look at it as a cartoon graphic, um, this helps, I think, to walk through the huge differences, whether we're talking about biodiversity, um, flood mitigation, the different types of land that are converted will have different impacts on the ecosystem services provided by those areas. When we think about carbon emissions, right, so if you have a big forest that's very heavy and full of biomass, full of that carbon, that carbon is going to be released to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and contribute to climate change if those forests are cut down and burned, which is what happens in the tropics. Um, to make room for more, more croplands. But there's a lot more carbon and a lot more biodiversity in most cases in those mature forests than in a log forest or in a patch, patchwork area where we have shifting cultivation. Um, and of course, there'll be the, the lowest amount of carbon emissions in a degraded area or in a, or in a pasture. Um, and it's interesting because you often hear industry or um, pro big ag groups will push to say that it doesn't make any sense to clear a forest. Forests are too costly to clear. Why wouldn't people focus on using those degraded lands that would be much easier to use? And I've spent a lot of time just studying that because that concept of using degraded lands is terrific. Of course, that would be wonderful if we could do that. But in fact, we know very little about where degraded lands are located how much there is. There's huge disagreement in the scientific literature. But I think perhaps most important to point out is regardless if there's enough degraded lands, those lands are almost always being used. Um, they're not empty lands. They're not free and easy. There are huge land tenure and community displacement issues. And also some of these lands are degraded because they're not suitable for, for cropland production. They're on steep slopes or have very poor soils. They may also be far from markets and very expensive um, to try to set up cultivation. And then you would think about road networks. There's a, a huge number of ripple effects that would come from using these lands. We can also simply see that when we look back in time, when croplands expanded, they didn't expand into degraded, land, into degraded lands. This is a study I conducted um, a decade ago, but I used a range of, of high resolution satellite data and compared the, the snapshots through time to get a sense for when there was when croplands expanded. Let's look back in time and see what was there first. What was there before that cropland expanded? And what we found is that in most cases, forests were there. Forest and disturbed forest were the sources for more than 80% of new agricultural lands in the 1980s and 1990s. And this trend has continued well over the last two decades. And this is a huge issue. We already started talking about this, but tropical forests provide critical ecosystem services. Um, 
it's it's clearing a rainforest to make space for soy to feed to large scale industrial animal farms is a is a huge choice that we would be making, um, and and one that we're we're actively making today. Just a quick review of the types of ecosystem services provided by forests. They're home to more than 70% of the world's plant and animals. Um, they provide sustenance and livelihoods for more than 500 million forest dependent people. They reduce flooding, protect watersheds, regulate climate on local to global scales. Um, but despite this importance, we continue to clear forests at alarming rates. More than 10 million hectares of forest were cleared annually um, over the last decade, 2010 to 2020. There's an extra two. Um, and if you look at, I'm trying to understand how big that area is, that's th about three times the size of Wisconsin. So a really large area. A lot of the clearing in the past happened in Brazil. This is showing the ranking of rainforest countries with the most forest loss between 2000 and 2012. So Brazil was always clearing the most. However, um, Brazil's deforestation rates dramatically declined for a period of time. However, lately, they've gone back up. You may have heard about the um, very large-scale fires happening in, in Brazil, in part because of them having a different president and this different this Bolsonaro political regime has really favored agriculturalists and um, provided incentives for expansion. Um, this is showing the shift as we see places like the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Colombia starting to, to creep up in their deforestation rates over the last decade. And I will will, will stop um, discussing this here and leave you with a link to my lab group. I would love to answer any questions you might have or otherwise be in touch with you. And I would be thrilled to have some of you join my People, Land, and Food class, which is Geography, Environmental Studies 309. Um, and I'll teach that next semester. And in that class, we'll take a couple of weeks to talk about what are the solutions for things like this. How can we figure out how to reduce that deforestation? So we can walk through some of those solutions as well as consider um, these broader concepts around agriculture around the world. All right, thanks so much for your attention. I hope you're having a great day.